Wikipedia is a fascinating rabbit hole of information. You click one link, and then another, and then the next thing you know you've wasted a whole evening. But be careful where you click. Wikipedia is home to some seriously disturbing stories. Here are 10 of the most terrifying Wikipedia pages out there. Number 10. America Sings What could be terrifying about Disneyland? The original happiest place on Earth. The Anaheim theme park is known for its innovative amusement park rides and stage shows and has been thrilling guests for over a half a century. But not all their new attractions are winners, and in 1974 they brought in one that would have an infamous legacy. The bicentennial of America's nationhood was approaching, and they wanted a new show to celebrate the country's heritage. The result was America Sings, a replacement for the classic Carousel of Progress show. Both took place in a rotating theater where audiences would sit and different scenes would play out around them. This one replaced the family of the future with a collection of funny audio-animatronic animals singing wacky songs about American history led by the pompous eagle Sam, voiced by the famous Burl Ives. What could go wrong? All it takes is one horrible incident. It was only nine days after the attraction opened when tragedy struck. Deborah Gale Stone, an 18-year-old, was working as a hostess at the attraction. She was in the back of the attraction as the stage show was shifting before the beginning of the next act. No one was there to know exactly what happened, but it's likely she was trying to get from one stage to another and slipped due to the sudden movement. What is known is that she was crushed between the moving wall and one of the stationary walls with no one around to notice. The audience members heard her screams and staff members ran to the back to investigate, but she was already dead. The show was quickly shut down. An investigation began into how something could go horribly wrong and Stone's parents sued. Disney eventually settled out of court and many people assumed this would bring the curtain down on America Sings for good. They were very wrong. While the attraction shut down after the incident, Disney never stood still. As soon as they were cleared by the police to re-enter, they cleaned the area and installed new safety lights as well as drew up plans to remodel the theater with breakaway walls. But only three days after the tragedy, America Sings Theater was open for business again, pulling in thousands of guests to see Eagle Sam sing only feet away from where Deborah Gale Stone met her end. The theater continued to operate the show for 14 years, with Stone's death only being a footnote in Disney history. Ultimately, the tragedy had nothing to do with its eventual closure. It just started getting out of date as the bicentennial became history itself. But many of the audio animatronics live on as members of the cast in Splash Mountain. This next entry might be classed as a hero or a villain, depending on who you ask. Number 9. David Polides By all accounts, David Polides is an upstanding guy, working for 20 years as a police officer in San Jose and serving on the SWAT team before becoming a detective. While he did have a brush with the law when he was accused of falsely raising money for a charity, he seemed to be an agent of the law. However, his true interests lay elsewhere, and after retiring, he became increasingly interested in conspiracy theories. His first passion was the mystery of Bigfoot, as he founded a research group to try and find the mysterious creature. Like everyone else involved, he wasn't able to find the man-ape, but he spent a lot of time in national parks while searching, and that might have led him to an even bigger mystery. Is there a secret horror lurking in America's national parks? Polides was reportedly working in a national park on his Bigfoot hunt when he talked to an off-duty park ranger. The man didn't know anything about giant man-apes roaming the park, but he had noticed something unusual. His park supposedly had an unusual number of missing people, some of whom had been walking with a partner and disappeared without a trace when they turned around. While the hiking partner was always suspect number one, the police rarely found any motive or evidence linking them to the case, and the disappearances almost always went cold. Polides began investigating and soon launched a new series titled Missing 411, and this he claimed to uncover a mysterious series of disappearances around the world, almost all of which lacked any explanation and no evidence of where the missing people went. What's even more disturbing is what isn't there. National parks are dangerous places, especially if you're alone. There are often steep cliffs to fall off and wildlife that might not be happy to see human guests. But in the cases that Polides spotlights, there are rarely any signs of a struggle or a fall. He also pointed out that the national parks do not seem to keep a record of the people who went missing in their parks, meaning key evidence is often missing. Polides has not given a theory for what's going on at the parks, although he says he doesn't expect it to be simply a criminal matter. Skeptics have called his investigations overly theatrical and accused him of trying to create a conspiracy where there is not one. But one thing is for sure, the disappearances he spotlights are real. Some might be criminal cases, some might be tragic accidents, but if there's a connecting factor, no one knows what it is. Sometimes the most terrifying thing of all can be the human body. Number 8. Locked in syndrome By all accounts, the patient seems dead. There's no sign of movement, they're not responding to any questions, and they don't seem to respond to physical stimuli. Yet their vital signs are strong. The likely scenario, the doctors assume, is that they're in a vegetative state. 
physically alive but with no higher brain function, only kept alive by machines. But what doctors can't tell is that inside the person is fully conscious and aware of everything going on around them, and inside they're screaming for help. This is reality for someone suffering from locked-in syndrome, a terrifying condition where cognitive function is completely intact but the body is almost completely paralyzed, with the only physical movements usually preserved being the ability to blink and move the eyes up and down. What's worse is that these are both movements that could be mistaken for involuntary reflexes, which raises an even more frightening prospect. In the past, patients who had locked-in syndrome could often be misdiagnosed and assumed to be comatose. They would usually be put into a nursing home where no effort would be made to rehabilitate them, like what happened to Julia Tavolaro in the 1970s, a young woman who suffered a stroke. She was almost completely paralyzed and it took six years until anyone noticed she was fully conscious. When nurses notice subtle movements in reaction to their comments, but many victims are unable to move even that much, and what makes this condition even scarier is that there doesn't seem to have one cause. It has many. The most common cause is a stroke that affects the brainstem, cutting off the function to the rest of the body. This can happen without warning due to an invisible blood clot, but that's not the only possible cause. Cases of locked-in syndrome have been caused by poisoning from snake bites, damage to the brain, or even an overdose of medication. But the most common cause of a similar condition might be the disease ALS, which damages the nerve connections and slowly strips people of their ability to move. And for virtually all cases, there is no cure. While some patients can regain movement or speech through extensive physical therapy, it's rare, but modern technology offers a little hope. While until recently the only method that could be used to communicate for locked-in patients was blinking to indicate letters on a board, eventually scientists have developed more advanced methods like computers controlled by only eye movement. But the disorder can still strike at any time, for a number of reasons, with no warning. This next entry is one of the most mysterious disappearances of all time, in one of the safest places on Earth. Number 7. The Disappearance of Emanuela Orlandi Vatican City isn't a normal country. With only a few hundred permanent residents and smaller than most cities, it's really more of a fortress for the Catholic Church. And as a place of holiness and faith, one would expect it to be safe. You probably don't have to worry about getting mugged by a cardinal. But you're not invincible within its borders and the city-state has had a dark cloud hanging over it since 1983. That was the year when Emanuela Orlandi, the 15-year-old daughter of Eric Cole and Maria Orlandi, left her home. Her father worked for the Vatican Bank and she and her siblings had grown up in the shadow of the Pope. It was the start of summer and she was taking flute lessons over her vacation. She took the bus to her music school on June 22nd. But that day, she was late to class, and she wouldn't be showing up, ever again. In the aftermath of the disappearance, investigators tried to piece together the mystery. Her older brother Pietro often accompanied her on the bus, but he was too busy to go that day, something that has haunted him for decades since. That night, a few hours after she'd gone missing, her family said they received a phone call from her, and it was the last time anyone heard her voice. She claimed to have been offered a job working for Avon Cosmetics, something that made little sense given the isolated nature of Vatican City. A friend of Orlandi's claimed they'd seen her get into a dark BMW which drove off, leaving no trace of Emanuela Orlandi. The police investigated, getting tips from various sources that they'd had seen Orlandi around Italy. One claimed that she had even run away while others said she had changed her name. The Pope even personally got involved, pleading for her return. But what actually happened to Emanuela Orlandi? Many theories emerged in the decades since, few of them good. Less than a month after the disappearance, a Turkish terror group supposedly claimed responsibility, demanding the release of a gunman who had attempted to assassinate the Pope. Others pointed to possible links to organized crime. Orlandi's father, who had access to billions of dollars in his role at the Vatican Bank, would be an inviting target for blackmail by the Mafia, but kidnapping someone from under the Pope's nose might be a bridge too far for the often devout Italian Mafia. Others pointed to a darker secret, notably the controversial exorcist Father Gabriel Amorth, who claimed a Vatican sex conspiracy might have been involved in the kidnapping. Orlandi might in fact never left the Vatican, but almost 40 years after she vanished into the night, the case is not giving up its secrets so easily. Sometimes the mystery is easier to unlock, but no less chilling. Number 6. The Murder of Kim Wall Swedish freelance journalist Kim Wall was never one to back away from a story, and when she got the chance to interview one of Denmark's most eccentric citizens, she was not going to say no. Peter Madsen was an entrepreneur with a fascination with rocket fuel and homemade submarines, and he wanted to invite Wall into one of his submersibles, the pint-sized UC-3 Nautilus. It was a tight fit, and going deep under the water in a homemade metal box with someone you barely know seems like a recipe for disaster, especially as she was planning to move to Beijing only a week later. But Wall's journalistic instincts told her there was a story to follow, and she met with Madsen on a moment's notice to board his submarine and head to the deep. 
the ship would never resurface, and soon Wall's story would be on the headlines around the world. But this was only the beginning of the story. Wall's boyfriend called the police that night to report her missing, and the next morning the ship was found floating in the water. Madsen was rescued from the water and claimed he had dropped Wall off safely, but soon admitted that she hadn't survived the trip. He claimed that she had died in an accidental fall and he dumped her body at sea. He was charged with manslaughter, but a few days later the disturbing truth would start to come out. A bicyclist discovered parts of Wall's body on a beach, and more body parts started washing up around the area. Most disturbingly, when police investigated Wall's torso, they found evidence that she hadn't died in an accident. Her body was covered with 15 stab wounds. It was clear she'd been murdered and there was only one suspect. What was behind the madness of Peter Madsen? The Danish millionaire was known to be unusual, but when police charged him with murder and dug into his past, they found he had a morbid obsession far beyond what they feared. For one thing, his internet history was full of videos of people being killed in horrible ways. He was soon convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison. But a maniac who kills someone on their homemade submarine isn't going to be contained easily. In 2020, he attempted an escape from prison by claiming to be wearing a bomb belt and holding a prison psychologist hostage. He's considered to be one of Denmark's most dangerous living criminals, which made it all the more shocking when he got married behind bars to an admirer in 2020. And we hope they're not planning any underwater trips together. It wasn't the only recent nightmare on the high seas. Number 5. COVID-19 Pandemic on Diamond Princess Ah, cruising on the high seas. Is there a better vacation? Everything's under one roof, the food is all you can eat, and there's never a shortage of things to do even if you don't want to take the off-boat excursions. That's the kind of relaxing vacation people were expecting aboard the Diamond Princess, a British-owned luxury cruise ship that set sail in early 2020. They probably weren't paying attention to the news, as the mystery disease COVID-19 was starting to ravage the world, and it was soon going to hit home. The ship set sail on January 20th, 2020 for a round-trip tour of Southeast Asia. An 80-year-old passenger from Hong Kong had been feeling ill, but he didn't feel like missing the cruise. He left after only one leg of the cruise, but his virus stayed on board, and would soon be making itself at home. But the real trouble was yet to come. It was February 1st when the ship arrived in Okinawa, Japan and the staff received dire news. The old man who had disembarked had tested positive for COVID-19. The ship was quarantined at port, but on board everything seemed normal. Facilities like fitness clubs and theaters remained open, and people bellied up to the buffet. When the ship returned to port again, it was quarantined for a second time, but this time they wouldn't be getting out nearly as easily. Officials from Japan's Ministry of Health boarded and began to test people for COVID. Sure enough, a full third of the people tested were positive, which meant the virus had already been spreading on the ship for a while. There were 3,700 people on board the Diamond Princess, and Japan quickly decided to quarantine the entire ship for two weeks. Those who wished their holiday would go on forever got their wish. The Diamond Princess would become the first major flashpoint for the COVID-19 pandemic, and over the next few days, hundreds more cases of the virus would be detected. At this point, no one knew much about the virus, and there were a few ways to treat it. Soon, the infected started dying, all older patients were much more vulnerable. The thousands of passengers now stuck in their rooms, with increasingly sparse food supplies being delivered to them, were desperate to get home, but no one could tell them when or if they'd be released. It wasn't until February 17th when the US government chartered planes to bring their citizens home from the ship, but other countries would be much slower. The last passengers didn't leave the Diamond Princess until March 1st, by which point 14 people had died. The cruise industry would be largely dormant for more than a year due to the pandemic, but it's likely the current cruises will be at least 3,700 passengers short. But in a quiet town in Wales, a different disaster that scarred a town forever began in the most unexpected of places. Number 4. The Aberfan Disaster it was a quiet morning on October 21, 1966. The quiet Welsh town of Aberfan had been a popular location for mining companies to harvest coal, and the surrounding area was filled with collierly spoil tips, what looked like small man-made black mountains. It was part of the landscape by now. No one gave it much thought as the town went about its business. Families began the day dressing the children for school and sending them on their way before their parents went off to work. But no one could see something was very wrong. One of the spoil tips was over 100 feet high. In violation of regulations, heavy rain had inundated the coal with water, and it was increasingly unstable, and as the school day began at the Pontglas Junior School, the coal began to slide forward. The mountain was about to collapse, and a massive surge of coal sludge lurched directly toward Aberfan, and the Junior School was directly in its path. The massive spoil tip turned into a river of sludge with 140,000 cubic yards sliding down the mountain, crushing two cottages in its way and killing everyone inside. In the center of the village, witnesses said they could hear what sounded like thunder, getting louder and louder, but it was too late to do anything. 
The avalanche plowed into the junior school, covering it with a thick, inky substance and destroying the structure and anyone in its path. The school was full of children and teachers, and teachers had only seconds to try to protect their pupils. Nancy Williams, the school's meal clerk, shielded five children with her body. They all survived, but she wasn't so lucky, becoming probably the most famous victim of the disaster. But when the rubble cleared, the toll would be devastating. At first, it seemed impossible to even get into the school, with a massive mountain of sludge blocking the entrances. Local residents turned up at the school to manually clear the rubble, many desperate to find their own children. Soon, they started pulling the surviving children out of the rubble, with 21 students and 5 adults surviving. But by 11 a.m. that morning, they weren't finding any more survivors, only bodies. In total, 144 people died in the Aperfan disaster, one of the worst industrial accidents in the history of humanity. 116 of the casualties were children, and people who grew up in Aberfan in the decades since said it seemed almost like every family in town lost a child in the disaster. A massive inquest into the mining disaster ensued, many regulations were tightened, and today, a memorial garden sits in the middle of Aberfan, paying tribute to the unfathomable loss. The Aberfan disaster devastated Wales, but could this next event devastate the whole world? Number 3. The Carrington Event It was September 1, 1859, and the sun was looking unusual. It was in the midst of a massive geomagnetic storm, in fact, the strongest in ever recorded history. It was so intense that it was affecting Earth's atmosphere, with displays similar to the aurora borealis being reported globally. Scientists believe it was caused by a coronal mass ejection that happened to be in the direction of Earth. It caused a massive solar flare that was observed by astronomer Richard Christopher Carrington, who would later become its namesake. But for most people, it was just a curiosity in the sky with few effects. Around the world, people saw strange things happening in the atmosphere, and it livened up their often mundane 19th century lives. But select people noticed something very different. Technology was in its early stages, and few people had electronic devices to observe. The one exception? The early telegraph systems all over Europe and North America. Suddenly, operators would pick up the device and get a nasty electric shock. The pylons carrying the signals started emitting dangerous sparks. Even more oddly, some telegraph machines seemed to still work after being disconnected. The current was strong as ever, even stronger in fact, and it seemed to be coming from places other than its usual sources. Some telegraph machines were damaged while others maintained their usual abilities, with one managing to maintain power for up to two hours while disconnected. It was an odd chapter in history, but it could foretell the apocalypse. In 1859, the Carrington event caused very little long-term damage because few items were affected. Most machines then ran on steam or coal power. Today, almost all run on either electricity or delicate digital connections. Another massive solar storm could cause a massive disruption in those systems. As today's connections could easily overload due to the surge of electricity generated by the solar storm, not just causing massive blackouts, but permanently damaging the infrastructure and setting back mankind's available technology by decades or even centuries. The effects of a solar storm are hard if not impossible to prevent, and if a solar storm happens, there's no way to predict or stop it. That means all of mankind's technological progress could be at the mercy of something millions of miles away and totally out of our control. The world is full of mysteries, but few as chilling as this one. Number 2. The Beast of Givoudon The world is full of mysterious animals that may or may not exist. The United States has the shambling, hairy Bigfoot. Scotland has the potential surviving pliosaur known as Nessie. Mexico has the small but hungry chupacabra. But most of these cryptids have two things in common. They've never been captured, and they've never left any bodies in their wake. The same can't be said for the monster that terrorized the French region of Le Gévaudan between 1764 and 1767. It all started when a young woman saw a mysterious wolf-like creature approach her cattle. The bulls kept it at bay, and she would later describe it like a wolf but not like a wolf. No one paid much attention to her story, until a teenage girl was killed by an animal only a short time later, and more attacks against livestock, children, and even adults became common. A pattern emerged, and the animal knew exactly how to kill, targeting the head and the neck of the victims. So what was hunting the people of Le Gévaudon? Some speculated that a pair of animals might have been behind the attacks, since it was hunting so fast and often in far apart locations. In January 1765, eight friends were attacked by the beast and managed to fend it off by staying in a tight group. The survivors eventually got the attention of King Louis XV, and hunting the beast became a national priority. An elite military unit was sent to Le Gévaudon including two professional wolf hunters. One of them killed a large gray wolf, one of the largest ever seen, and proclaimed it to be the beast. But the attack soon continued, with a dozen or more people dying. In the end, it was a local hunter named Jean Chastel who reportedly brought the beast down. 
the body of the creature was taken to a surgeon who stuffed it for taxidermy and reportedly discovered the remains of the last victim inside. Which raises the question, what was the Beast of Le Gévaudan? Many people considered the creature to have supernatural origins, making it one of the first reported attacks by a werewolf. However, most modern historians speculate it was likely a wolf or a pack of wolves, and some of the incidents may have been embellished due to hysteria. The beast's body was displayed for a time at the castle of Louis XV, but it has since been lost and only drawings remain. Most reports indicate it was a wolf, but one larger than any seen before. With an odd posture, this has led many scientists to propose more exotic origins such as a lion or a Tasmanian tiger. It might have also been a crossbreed between two animals. But as terrifying as the wave of attacks were, it wasn't as atypical as it seemed. France saw tens of thousands of deaths due to wolf attacks in the 18th century alone. But the waves of deaths in Le Gévaudan was undoubtedly among the bloodiest. But there is nothing scarier than the end. Number 1. Endling It's September 7, 1936 in the Hobart Zoo in Tasmania. A single animal paces the ground. It's a thylacine or a Tasmanian tiger, and the carnivorous marsupial has been living here alone for a long time. It beds down for the night, but it's an unusually cold night in Tasmania, and sometime during the night, the animal known as Benjamin freezes to death. The zookeepers are later accused of neglect, but they assume they'll find another specimen to display at the zoo soon enough. But after months of combing Tasmania, they never do, because Benjamin is an endling, the very last Tasmanian tiger in the world. With his passing, an entire species passes into oblivion. The cause? The combination of hunting and the introduction of dogs and humans into its habitat. The species' fate was sealed long before Benjamin passed, and it's happened many times before. A lot of the time, humans don't know when extinction happens. Millions of species went extinct before we ever existed on the planet. Other times, a species we barely know about goes extinct when its habitat is destroyed. But when we keep endangered species in captivity as they reach the end of their existence, zookeepers and scientists often bear witness to the very last specimen passing away. This was the case for Lonesome George, the last Pinta giant tortoise. Hunting had decimated the slow-reproducing, long-lived species, although scientists did try to get George to mate with other subspecies. In the end, Lonesome George was well cared for by scientists until his death in 2012, at which point the entire species went with him. And there's usually only one cause. The passenger pigeon was one of the most dominant birds in the world, but hunting and competition dwindled its numbers for decades until it was heavily hunted, and the last passenger pigeon Martha died in captivity in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. And as we become more aware of the damage we do to the environment, we find more cases. Sometimes we become aware that we're looking at an endling before they pass, like in the case of the northern white rhinoceros. The species is still currently alive with two specimens known. The problem is Nanjin and Fatu are mother and daughter. They live in a sanctuary in Kenya, but are believed to be the last of their species, and the last male passed away in 2014. That means this species is simply running out the clock, and looking at the list of endangered species, it's likely more will join them soon. Want some more disturbing tales to fall asleep to? Check out scary urban legends that will keep you up all night, or watch this video instead.